Hey, this is Daniel, and welcome to Respawn Lounge. This week we're going to be talking about Dark Souls 2. studio today? Uh, Reva, as usual now, I guess. Mm. <laughs> well, we, we, we've already yeah. talked about how you're a mainstay now. Yeah, exciting. Wow. Um, the fun things. So, uh, Daniel Kemper is also here. Uh-huh, and Casey Moore, and this is my game hole. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going to be going over Dark Souls 2, so let's begin. Uh, we've already done... A Dark Souls one episode, so we're not going to give yeah. as much of a like a series overview. Uh, this is just going to be about kind of the differences about uh, like what two does differently from one, and then later three, uh, kind of the fan reactions to that, and what we think about those changes. So I'll let Dan talk about what exactly Dark Souls two is. So Dark Souls two is obviously, as implied by the title, a sequel to Dark Souls one. Um, it takes place in presumably the same universe. Um, with the undead curse and hollows and humanity-ish things and all that sort of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, but there's very few story tie-ins between Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2. Just one, I think. Yeah. Uh, just, well, not even really a story tie-in, it's just the, the thing with the old Dragon Slayer. Um, Which, you know, there's, there's you know, that. Could, there's... could even not be like a story tie-in, that could just be like a, a reference or an in-house joke. Yeah. There's uh there there is the Warriors of Sunlight um, statue. That's also, true. And which is also moved there. and in a strange spot. But as we see in Dark Souls three, there are more than one of those statues. So I mean, yeah, it's not that strange that it's it's strange that it's where it is, but it's not strange that it's duplicated. Mm -hmm. So um, like Dark Souls one, it's a sort of action RPG, uh, sort of Japanese made Western style thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a little more, it's streamlined is how From Software describes it, yeah. which by that they don't mean uh, like accessibility as far as like it's easier. It is, but... Yeah, it's, that's sort of unrelated. Yeah, what, what they mean is that they wanted to get rid of the backtracking and they wanted to give you warps from the start because they thought that that was a lot of unnecessary tedium in Dark Souls 1, which to some people may be true, but to a lot of people they thought that was a lot of the charm of Dark Souls 1 was like... Yeah, it may be questionable game design, but that's a lot of the theme of what this world is trying to convey, so... Yeah. Do you want to get into the world design a little bit? Sure. Uh, so, it begins... It, it, a lot of people talk about how it's the reverse of Dark Souls 1, how it begins, and instead of mm -hmm. going on a straight path and then splitting four ways to go find the four bad guys, you begin looking for the four bad guys. You start in your central hub area, and you've got... you got two directions you can go, basically, but they, yeah. they each split into another one. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you can actually fight them in any order. There's a third direction, but good luck. Yeah. Uh, it's got a giant pit. Yeah. The, two of them, well, yeah, two, two of them are, like, pretty easily accessible from the start. One's yeah. implied to be the first path because you're still fighting shitty hollow enemies. Um, and the other way to fight, like, knights you don't really have much of a chance against. But if you're a cleric uh, who has uh, blunt damage, mm -hmm. uh, you can actually pretty easily go into that area, uh, and that's where the cleric trainer is. Yeah. Which is also kind of reminiscent of Dark Souls 1, where you could go to the graveyard early if you were a cleric. Yeah. So it is interesting that like your class has a lot to do with what direction you can go, which is something we forgot in 3. Yeah. But, um, so the, the world structure is very... You, you go four ways, and then you are trying to meet one central goal of finding these four souls, as opposed to ringing the bells and then going to find the four souls. So you get the four, you can open a gate now, and you're on the hunt for the final boss at that point. It's a very straight shot. I, I don't think you have to backtrack through any areas. I'm pretty sure you do just, like, walk through, like, six consecutive areas. Uh, pretty much. Um, I mean, like, they're on sort of different paths off of the thing, but, like, there's only one order you can do them in. Yeah. Um, which that wasn't really... I don't, I don't think a lot of people had an issue with that. Um, one of my friends who's been playing it recently said that he didn't like... He, he thought that it was too esoteric in the beginning, which... I had to remind him that he beat Dark Souls 1. Yeah. Because uh, I think 1's way more esoteric. 
much more. Because um, um, he was like, yeah, I don't know how to get past the, the woman who's turned into a statue. And I was like, did you read the item descriptions? Like, you did in one to find your way around everything? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm not, sure, I'm not really sure what he meant by that. And I did want to have him on for this episode, and unfortunately, like, schedules didn't quite line up. Mm. Her, but, uh... Yeah, like, I, I didn't really have any trouble with Dark Souls 2 uh, as far as, like, getting navigating or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I remember getting lost for, like, three hours in Dark Souls 1, uh, trying to find the door that used the key to lower on Denver. Like, I'd read the yeah. key, I just couldn't find where the door was. Yeah, I had the same problem. Um, and, yeah, I mean, 2, like, points you in the right direction pretty much all the time. Yeah, uh, I never got lost in 2, mm-hmm. uh, except for in the uh, get lost area. Yeah, the, is, the woods. Yeah, yeah, there's like a... There's a heavy fog, like, misty woods area uh, that you're supposed to get lost in. But it's like, it's pretty much just a big circle. Yeah. There's not really too much you can, like, you know, like if you, if you run, away from your goal on. If you run straight as soon as you get in, you'll find your way out. Yeah. So, uh, another thing that's really different about this game is your character's motivation. Yeah. In Dark Souls 1, your... Your objective isn't... You have, like, a prophecy that you're told you're supposed to fulfill, which the uh, truth to that is speculated. I, yeah. I think I think we're agreed that um, the prophecy isn't real, and that's just, like, people trying to push you to do what they want. I mean, the prophecy's real, but there isn't a chosen one. The, the, uh, if you don't remember, the prophecy in one is that uh, one day, uh, like, the chosen undead will come and um, ring the bells of awakening and then, you know, get the Lord Vessel and then succeed Lord Gwyn and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas in 2, there's not really any uh, driving motivation like that. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think there is a prophecy of any kind in 2. Like, no. There's, there's, no, there's no reason anybody should believe that you're going to go and solve anything, and you kind of don't. 2 makes a deliberate point of that also. Um, one of the first things that you're told is um, one day you'll find yourselves at the gate of a great castle and you won't really know why. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you play the game and you're at the... <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's, it's not... Um, I think they, they tried to go for like, you know, this sort of um, wanderless meandering uh, mm-hmm. but with like a really linear path. Uh, you're, yeah. you're, you sort of <laughs> do just end up at a castle without really knowing why. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's a big part of the game. Because I remember when I finished it, we talked about like, I, I said like, what was the plot of this game? And you're like, I have no idea. And yeah, as as kind of annoying as that is, after like all the fun speculation that came with Dark Souls One, uh, I do think it's appropriate. You know, like, yeah, it, it flat out tells you in the beginning that you're going to get to the castle and not understand it. And I like t- at the very end of the game, I didn't know what my character's motivations were. I mean, it was, you know, jump in a horrible glowing pit and, like, absolve yourself of the curse somehow. And you see other characters yeah. in the game, Aldia and uh, the, the Great Dragon, I think it was called. Mm-hmm. Um, you see them working, and you see, how, like, Vendrick spent his whole life trying to find a way to solve the curse. You know, other than just, like, consuming human effigies and, like, prolonging it, they, they wanted to find a way to stop the curse from happening and causing another cycle. Yeah. Which presumably is your goal, too, but you don't really do a whole lot... To, to meet that goal. Your, yeah. your character seems like he's just existing and killing bad people. Uh, even the end of the game uh, leaves it unclear, even to the end, what your actual goal was. Uh, because at the end, um, just like in Dark Souls 1, you... In, in this one, you get to the throne of one instead of uh, to the uh, to the first bonfire. Mm-hmm. Um, but you still have two choices, either link the bonfire or begin the Age of Darkness. Uh, and the game, uh, you get to the throne of one and sit down, but you never get a choice or see your character make a choice of doing either of these two, t- two things. Mm-hmm. Um, it's implied that obviously one of these things had to happen, but even at the very end of the game, you still have no idea what you're actually trying to do. Yeah, it, it's almost as though your character's not even clear on what their motivations are. Like, the player's not, but it just seems like your character is also just doing what he's told. Yeah. Walking around and hitting the stuff that bleeds the most. Mm-hmm. Or doesn't because most of the enemies are giant stone creatures and yeah, empty <laughs> suits of armor. That's how it goes. Um, and that's another thing I want to talk about is the bosses because a lot of people complain that all the bosses are dudes in armor, which is kind of kind of true. That's kind of true. But also, you have like the Looking Glass Knight is a really interesting boss. Yeah, uh, Velstad is a really interesting boss. 
Um, for people who don't know the, the Looking Glass Knight, what he does is if someone tries to invade you while you're fighting him, there's a chance that he'll get summoned into your boss arena. So you have to fight the boss as well as another player. Yeah. Um, the, Which is like certain doom for you, but it's kind of a cool idea. Yeah. The knight has like a uh, has a glass shield which deflects spells, mm-hmm. which is super cool. But it'll also like he'll like put it on the shield and it'll break and like enemy invaders will like pop out of his shield and try to kill you. Mm-hmm. Uh, or just if if you're not on mine, um, random NPCs. Yeah, which you know is horribly horribly unfair, but it's really cool. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's unfortunately never happened to me. I really wish it would, but. Mm. Um, but I, I did play Dark Souls 2 when it was, like, dead already. Yeah. And also on PS3, where it was never alive in the first place. <laughs> uh, but even even when I played Scholar when it came out on PC, uh, it I, it just never happened, unfortunately. Um, invasions also seem like... W- in Dark Souls 1, invading felt like... It wasn't, like, honorable or anything. Like, people talk about, like, duels and honor in Dark Souls, and I th- think they're misplaced. Well, there is... I mean, because there there's is an arena... Uh, there's also honorable invasions or friendly invasions with the uh, the red sign soapstone. Right. But, one. but um, there would be like, like pe- people would invade you and like expect you to like you know bow and engage in combat. But like most of the time, they're invading someone who's not not wanting to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, like, like years on, um, it made sense that people were expecting like most of the people buying to just be. Accepting of like the sort of PvP standards at that point. I mean, there there were still going to be new people at that point, but significantly less. Right. And uh, that's another thing too. Is two is very good PvP. Yeah, great PvP. Uh, it has, I think, I think it's two dedicated areas that each have three arenas for PvP. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, on top of the usual just invasions, so two does a very good job of like creating a place where this is quote acceptable. Yeah. Like, like there's there's a place for the friendly invasion, so there's no confusion if you get invaded. What's what's happening? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it too is also where I began to do invasions as a, a filthy, horrible hexer, <laughs> uh, where my strategy was hit them once and win. Yeah, but like um, and like even with uh, like hexing being like really strong, uh, I feel like Dark Souls two actually had very balanced PvP, especially in comparison mm-hmm. to um, one and three. Yeah, uh, the PvP in one was use the same sword as everybody else and just hit R1 forever. Yeah. And, you know, throw up the magic bullets and let them play the game for you. Yeah. Like, there, there was some diversity in 1, um, but there was... And there's very limited diversity in 3, I think. There's, there's less. Pretty much none. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but there was, like, pretty much anything you could do was viable in 2. Mm-hmm. Well, unless the weapon was, like, actually just terrible. Yeah, and there weren't a lot of terrible... I mean, there were some very good weapons, like the... Uh, what What's the... The Red Hilted Halberd, I think, was one of the better weapons. Yeah, because you can just turn into a Beyblade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but even, like, just the starting, like, short sword is not a terrible weapon by any means. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and there's also, uh, because of the way infusions work and, like, armors, because you just have more stats in general to use, you're not, it's not immediately clear what build the other person is using, like it was in Dark Souls 1. Yeah. There's a lot of crossover between builds, too. Mm-hmm. Um, since PvP, uh, since the way... Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 3 use um, your level to determine uh, where you go into PvP, uh, whereas Dark Souls 2 is determined by um, soul souls, which, yeah, your soul memory, which is just the total amount of souls that you've ever had, or like ever collected throughout the entire mm-hmm. game. Whether you spent them or not. Yeah, whether you spent them, lost them, done whatever with them or not. Mm-hmm. Um, which provides, or like, which makes it so that uh, you don't really have any reason to not level up. Uh, and so the since there's like a lot of stats and you can level up pretty quickly, um, most builds at the end become like multiple things. So like you know you'll have um, like a really strong strength build, but it will also have like weird cleric buffs or like weird magic buffs or something on it. Mm-hmm. Because even though you get a lot of stats, and there's a lot of stats that are worth dumping into, because uh, you also have what's the ag- agility adaptability? Yeah, adaptability. Yeah, which is like the effectiveness of your iframes on your rolls, which kind of a silly stat I think, but. It was still another dump stat. So you in Dark Souls one, I think I finished the game at like level one hundred ish. I finished mm-hmm. Dark Souls two at like two twenty. Yeah. So you have the same like I think the the total number of stats you can boost. I think there's one more stat in in two. I think there might be there might be two more. Well, it's it's not a lot more. Yeah. But like 
like relatively, you still gain way more levels, and you still have a, about the same drop off points. Mm-hmm. Like in, in Dark Souls One, after about fifty, your bonuses for leveling a stat aren't as high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's fifty for uh, for every stat is the um, is like the, the drop off point. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and that's the same in two. So you're getting to 50 strength, and then there's just like not a lot of reason to go beyond that. Like maybe 60. Yeah, because there's some weapons that require um, like 60 strength or something. Yeah. So I, I think the, the highest strength requirement in Dark Souls 2 is a DLC weapon, uh, which is like 70 or so. Yeah. But even if you got 70 strength, and even if you were, you know, buffing your ability to wear armor and your health and your endurance and stuff, you still probably have like 20 or 30 levels to spend by the time you're finished with everything in, in a new game run. Yeah. So that's 30 levels that can be spells. That's 30 levels that can be faith to use buffs with. Yeah, it could be decks to, you know, dual wield more weapons or something. Mm-hmm. Like, there, there are people who just, like, completely abstain from using armor and just buff their, their weapon stats so they have two of the strongest sword in the game and just dual wield them. <laughs> Which is pretty fun. Yeah. And that's another thing that Dark Souls 2 does very well is uh, the way it handles dual wielding with the power stance. Yeah. So the way that works is, in Dark Souls 1, you could dual wield, insofar that you could put a weapon in both hands. And it was terrible. And it, Yeah, and it, it didn't grant you any more offensive viability, you just also had a weapon in your left hand. Mm. Which, I mean, you would have the advantage of, of, say, like, you know, use a sword and then have a spear, so you have, like, both weapons versatility. But you can also just equip two weapons in your right hand slot, and just cycle between them as you need them. Mm. There wasn't a lot of reason that you need to alternate using a sword and spear, like, one hit after another. Yeah. But in Dark Souls 2, if you have 1.5 times the required stats to wield a weapon, you can use both of them and activate power stance by holding the, like, the two-hand button. Um, mm. And then you go into a unique stance where your moveset changes. And that's unique to, I think, every weapon class and some combinations of them. Because mm. I think you can cross, like, the short sword and the dagger. I think they have one. But, like... Two ultra great swords is one stance. Two spears is one stance, and yeah. they have like completely You're, different movesets. It I, it does have to be the same type of weapon. Oh, it does. Yeah. Okay. But you can have two different weapons of the same type. Yeah. So you don't have to have like spear and spear. You can have spear and like longinus, or you can have short sword and scimitar. Yeah. As long as they're the the same weapon class, um, they like classify together, uh, and you can use both of them. So if you have, like, special effects on one weapon and, like, a different special effect on another weapon, uh, you can hit with both special effects. Yeah. And a lot of them do have, uh, like, if you use two Ultra Grave Swords, you'll do an overhead swing with both swords at the same time. Which looks awesome. Which looks really cool. It's really hard to hit with. But if you do, you do two Ultra Grave Swords worth of two-handed damage, mm-hmm. which is insanely high. Like, you'll, you'll probably, like, wipe out an invader in one hit with that. Um, and if we're going to talk about invaders, we have to talk about dying, and what dying means in Dark Souls 2 rather than what it meant in 1. I think 2 actually has uh, the best system for it. Like, the, even, like, just mechanically and lore-wise, I think it's the only one that really makes sense. Yeah. Or makes the most sense, at least. Yeah. So, in Dark Souls 1, you die, you become a zombie man, and you yeah. have to consume a humanity and then go and burn that humanity in order to go back to human which restores your online functionality, your ability to summon uh, players and NPCs, and a few of your other interactions, as well as I think you have to be human to get the bonus from having humanity for chaos weapons. Um, in one? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you, you can have soft humanity, but you also have to be human to get that boost, I think. Actually, I don't, I don't think you need to be. No? Um, but it helps, I think. Okay. Um, in two... You, whenever you die, you lose, I think it's a tenth of your maximum health down to a, a total of 50 if you continue to die. Yes. Uh, also, if you, uh, sort of side note, if you, um, Dark Souls 2 has a sin, like Dark Souls 1, where, you know, you, if you kill, like, just friendly NPCs or you just, like, be a horrible person, mm-hmm. uh, you'll collect sin. And if you become um, the sin level wretch, <laughs> um, your minimum HP goes down to 10% instead of 50. Oh, wow, I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, and is that also progressive? Like, if you have, like, the first level of sin, you drop down to 40% minimum? Um, or, or is it only when you hit that final threshold? I, I think it's I think it's progressive. There's, like... I don't, I don't actually remember exactly, but I, I'm pretty sure it's progressive. Um, it, once you hit, like, the first level, you can drop down to 40%, I think. And then the second level is wretch, and it drops you down to 10%. But you have to get, like, a lot of sin to get to wretch. Okay. That's interesting. Um, so yeah, what, what you do to get rid of that is you consume something called a human effigy, which you can't stock in any way. 
Like you, you don't you don't have a number next to your health and stamina that says like this is how much you have. But you also don't have to go to a bonfire in order to burn it. You just yeah. consume the item and you're a human now, regardless of what your hollow state was before that. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of reminiscent. This is this is a nicer way of what Demon Souls did. Because uh, yeah. in, in Demon Souls, if you died, you were down to fifty percent and you were stuck there until you beat a boss. Um, and also, if you died in Demon Souls, the area that you died in would get more difficult. Mm-hmm. So, on top of it, not our, it's not an easy game in the first place. Yeah. But it, when you die, now you have half the health to work with, and also enemies are going to hit harder. And also, like there might just be stronger enemies walking around. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what would normally? Ha- okay, I thought that first for a second. <laughs> you would um, you would die to a boss shortly after you restored your health to full. And now you're just in a sucky spot. So everyone would go back to the hub area, just jump off until they died, so they wouldn't have that risk of making the area harder. And they would just tough out the entire game with half of their health. Mm. Because everyone says, like, because there's Prepare to Die edition of Dark Souls 1. Like, you know, everyone's like, you're going to die in this game. Like, no, you're definitely going to die in Demon's Souls. There's no getting around it. Yeah. I'm I'm sure, strictly speaking, you can beat the game without dying, but, like... Well, no, you're required to die at the beginning of the game. uh, Yeah, that's true. But, like, as far as, like, gameplay purposes, like, you die to the Dragon God in the cutscene, but, like... You, yeah. You're you're not going to get through the remainder of the game without dying. Mm. Anyway. It's very, very difficult. <laughs> yeah. Dark Souls 2, A, not as difficult. B, that's progressive, so, like, I played a lot of the game and, like, you know, missing 10% of my health and just being like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like, what's, what's 10%? That's two levels or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um... But but it's also really generous with the human effigies. Like you can, yeah, you you can buy them. them, and eventually you can buy an infinite supply. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just find them everywhere. I'm I like to think that I'm good at Dark Souls. I know like relative to like you know PVPers and streamers and stuff, I'm probably nothing. But I'm, I mean, I've beaten all of the Dark Souls games. Yeah. Uh, and I use like maybe a third of my stock of human effigies on any given playthrough, and I feel like I die a lot. Like I die like at least four or five times in the um, uh, the. Iron Keep, old Iron Keep. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah, all the time. Area. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I've ever gotten through that area without dying. It's, I mean, it's a pretty difficult area. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they're they're pretty forgiving with uh, with human effigies. Um, even if you farm, like, if you don't go to New Game Plus and you farm the world completely out of enemies and you destroy absolutely everything, there's <laughs> no way for you to have human effigies anymore. Uh, there is still a source that will turn you human even if you don't have any human effigies. Mm-hmm. Isn't that just uh, helping someone fight a boss? Uh, no, actually, not even that. Um, the uh, the Milfinitos, uh, once you've collected them and you uh, you talk to them, if you don't have any human effigies and you're not human, uh, they'll just turn you human for free. Oh, cool. Yeah, no idea. Mm-hmm. But also, I've never been in that situation, so... Yeah. Uh, there's also a character who will... I think he only talks to you if you're hollow. Uh, yes. Um... It's, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, he has, like, some weird dual personality thing uh, where if you talk to him while you're human, uh, he's just, like, this is, like, really nice guy who's trying to, like, get you to stay away from him because he's very dangerous, and he's, like, locked in a cage, you know, like a magic cage for some reason. Uh, but if you're hollow, uh, he's, like, evil and will ask you to go out and assassinate people for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's an interesting side quest, too, because he'll be, like, go kill this really important NPC and take their item or whatever. One of them is Ladders with Gilligan, but you can just buy the item from them and show it to them. Yeah, um, I mean, there, there's a way around. Um, you don't have to actually kill any of them to finish the yeah, quest line. because one of them's Pete, and he'll just give you his helm. Yeah, uh, you can get that for free. Uh, one of them is the first texture trainer, uh, but you can just find... He wants his helmet, uh, you can just find it later on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of them is the uh, character who levels you up, uh, but she gives you the item freely. Yeah. And he also doesn't even take the item. He just wants you to. He just wants to see it. Yeah. So it's it's not uh, it's not very difficult to deal with, but it's a, it's an interesting way of dealing with the um, human versus hollow mechanics. Mm-hmm. And I really like that. Um, actually, sort of like gamifies the idea of um, you becoming progressively more hollow each time you die. Right. Because we talked about in Dark Souls one before how dying is canon to the game. Like, yeah. Like, however many times you've died in the game is how many times you canonically died. Mm-hmm. So it does a good job of bringing that into the world, like that gameplay feature that they could have just overlooked and nobody would have thought any different of it. I just wish they did it more, because I feel like Dark Souls 2 is the most powerful in the series for gamifying every mechanic it has. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I just really, really wanted to run with it. And that's, that's something that sort of disappointed me about 3, is A3, 3 acted like 2 never happened, yeah. as, as far as gameplay goes, because uh, you don't have the power stances, oh, yeah. you don't have like a lot of those features. Um, and you, you have a similar uh, like health drain when you die, but you just lose your embered state, which, that's a boost. You still have your base health. Yeah. Uh, being embered is just like being overpowered mode. Mm. It's, it's not a punishment, it's just a it extra takes bonus. away your golden tanuki suit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of people, when this game came out, they thought it was easy. Thought it was too easy. Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of that's coming from um, that these people played Dark Souls 1, got to understand its mechanics really well, got to understand how to play the game really well, um, and then went into 2, which is sort of like the same idea. So, you know, like, um, since it's a new game and like new people are going to be playing the game that have never played it before, uh, they have to, you know, ramp up the difficulty as the game goes on from a point of assuming that you don't know how to play Dark Souls. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of people who are complaining about it being difficult, it's not really a fair judgment for them to make because, you know, they've already gone through the trial and error of Dark Souls 1 to learn how to, you know, get through this game. But to someone who's never played Dark Souls at all, if they play 2, 2's still probably really tough for them. Yeah. Um, I do think if you compare them side by side, I, well, I don't know. I was gonna say I still think two is easier, but like I'm remembering all the ways you can break Dark Souls one. I mean, um, I if, think, if I you think play it as intended, I think two is easier. Yeah, um, Dark Souls one has exploits. Obviously, there's there's a lot of ways to get very overpowered very very quickly. Yeah, um, you, you can get like arguably the best weapon in the game the very first thing you do. <laughs> You can just walk over and grab this Y hand or die, and then just use it for the rest of the game and win. Yeah, uh, if you're a cleric um, and you take the uh, the master key, you can just walk over, get the Astora Straight Sword, uh, and have like a holy like faith scaling weapon at the very beginning of the game. Mm -hmm. the, that's as powerful as the supposedly crazy overpowered Drake Sword. Yeah, yeah, overpowered Drake Sword. <laughs> um, that, that's kind of an injury with Dark Souls. The Drake Sword is. It's 200 base power, but when you yeah. level it up, nothing happens. Yeah. Or, or it gets a little bit stronger, but it doesn't have any scaling, so it's only as strong as it starts. Mm -hmm. Which is the same of all... Is true of the same... Is also true of all dragon weapons in Dark Souls 1. Oh, really? Yeah. But the, the, I think it's the Dragon King's Great Axe is just, like, really strong no matter what. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you also need, yeah. like, crazy high stats to ever use it. Yeah, I mean, it requires, I think, like, 40... 45, 45 strength. strength, yeah. And also to kind of do something, like, really backwards to get it. Mm hmm Or no, I'm thinking of the Demon Great Axe that you get from the Asylum Demon, the first fight. Oh, that's the Demon Great Hammer, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, another thing that they changed in Dark Souls 2 is how NPC side quests work. Yeah. Um, um, mostly that there aren't any. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> um... See, I think the Dark Souls 2 characters are really interesting. Lucatiel is one of my favorite characters in the whole series, but... She's also, like, basically the only character with a story in 2. Yeah. Um, the way NPC side quests work in, in Dark Souls 2 is that um, to progress them, you summon them for boss fights. And if they survive the boss fight, then congratulations, you have advanced their story. Yeah. If not, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the good news is that they don't just die if you fail. Um, and I think you do get four opportunities to summon them, and you only need to succeed in three. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of them are really easy to overlook. Um, getting Lucatil to help you with the Rotten is very hard. Mm -hmm. Also, Lucatil's an idiot and will just stand in the fire and die. Yeah. Um, which is what I don't like about it, because I, I just don't like relying on AI to do anything in a game. Yeah. Um, like, Persona 3 is a weird comparison to make, but... Your characters act on the right. Yeah. It will, in the PS2 version is Persona 3. I think the PSP version changed this. Yeah, because you can control the characters in the PSP version. Yeah. So they'll just act on what their AI thinks is the best option, which is usually incorrect. Because <laughs> um, um, you can bring in knowledge to the game, like, I know this enemy is weak to ice, mm -hmm. but your ice character won't know that. So she'll cast a completely different spell, and you're like, no, that's not what I want. Um, yeah. Similarly, in uh, in Dark Souls 2, you'll summon Lucatiel to fight, uh, like, Smelter Demon. And Lucatiel can't do anything to Smelter Demon. Yeah. So, you know, if I were in control, I'd say, go stand in the corner and just let me do it. Mm -hmm. But no, she'll get right up in his face and just walk into his AoE over and over. So now you're on a timer. Andy has more health and hits harder. Mm -hmm. So 
summoning Lucatio for that fight makes that fight way more difficult. And yeah, also, he just has more HP and more damage. And he's already like not a super easy boss fight. No. And he has high defense because he's you know a fire smelter demon. Yeah. Um, but alternatively, it's really easy to overlook her in other areas too. So you're you're in the situation where if you screwed up getting her to the rotten, you have to bring her to the smelter demon boss fight. Yeah. Uh, if you want to complete her quest, and you do because it's it's really good. But I don't know. I, I kind of wish you just had to talk to the NPCs. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be nice. Or I mean, like um, some of the more creative stuff that they did with the uh, Dark Souls One uh, NPC side quests, mm-hmm. um, where you have to like talk to them and like do specific things. Mm-hmm. Um, like uh, Sigmire requires like certain, or like uh, I mean, like, even the, the less complicated ones, like Sigmire's, uh, require you to like give him certain items and stuff. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, like, helps um, advance his sort of themes of, like, I'm trying to be this great explorer, but I'm terrible at everything I do, and I'm relying you on, relying on, like, this random person for help all the time. Yeah. Um, and similarly to Dark Souls 1, I think all of the characters die at the end of their side quests. Actually, does Benhart? Um, well, actually, no, I, almost nobody dies at the end of Dark Souls 2. Look at goes hollow. Um, yeah, Look at goes hollow. Benhart does not die, but he gives you his sword. So he, um, then he dies, because he doesn't have a sword. But you, I mean, you never see that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like, he... Because he, he finishes his quest. Yeah. Um, but it, he, it, it he, is he still... He him for the final boss. Oh, yeah, you're right. But he still has a sword. Yeah, I don't know how that works. <laughs> he gives you his sword in, like, a past memory, which is really Oh, weird. yeah, because you can summon him to fight the, the giant lord. Yeah. I don't know. And, and you, you summon I guess a guy from the future in the past while you're in the past, and then he gives you his sword from the future while he's in the past, but he keeps his sword in the future. And you also keep his sword in the future. The time is... Convoluted, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, speaking of, I know I told you this, Dan, but uh, if anyone doesn't know, in Dark Souls 3, you can summon the character Night Slayer Sorg as a phantom. Oh, yeah. And you're supposed to help, you're supposed to bring him with you to fight a boss. But <laughs> if you backtrack through that area, you can find the real Night Slayer Sorg and make him fight his own phantom to the death. It's really weird. <laughs> so if you if you kill the real Night Slayer Sorg, the phantom doesn't disappear, even though he's like, he's Dead. gone from the world. Because uh, time was convoluted in Lothric, or in Dragon Lake. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. But causality is convoluted in, in Lothric. <laughs> I always, I always imagine like Sorry kills himself as a phantom, and then he's just like looking at himself as he starts to disappear. <laughs> it's, it's just Looper. It's the Paul's Looper. Yeah. It's Groundhog Day. Uh huh. Dark Souls One is Groundhog Day. Dark Souls One's Groundhog Day. <laughs> yeah, Dark, Dark Souls One Groundhog Day. Uh, Dark Souls Two is the plot of Terminator, uh, <laughs> and then uh, Dark Souls Three is just the plot of Looper. <laughs> okay, so there was also a remastering of sorts, which was, it, I mean, it was a remastering, but it was also a balance overhaul uh, mm-hmm. called Scholar of the First Sin, which came out, I think, a year later, maybe more. Yeah, around then. So what Scholar of the First Sin does is it makes it so enemy placements are different, the game in general is harder. Um, yeah. A lot of small details, like, I think bosses have some different attack patterns. Um, bosses have different attacks. Um, the placements of NPCs is different. Mm-hmm. Um, so that <laughs> so that people... Uh, Gavlan doesn't uh, lead you into a horrible trap in Scholar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and that's... I want to say that Scholar is the definitive version of this game, because, you know, it was created to kind of be like, okay, we got it this time. Like, it's yeah. not running at 20 FPS on the PS3 anymore. It's... Also includes all the DLC. Yeah, which is really cool. Uh, there's not if if you just care about content and not preserving like the integrity of the vanilla version of this game or whatever, Scholar is definitely the way to go. Yeah. But I have heard arguments that vanilla is better. Um, What's that argument? Mostly that the things like enemy placements and Scholar just like don't really make any sense in world. I think they make way more sense. I think they do too. Um, like in vanilla, why is there even a high knight in? the Forest of Fallen Giants. There's nothing around to, like, imply that he should have been there for any reason. Yeah. Um, uh, the Hyde Knights are in Hyde's Tower of Flame uh, in Dark Souls 2. It's called, like, the First Sin Edition. Yeah. Which makes sense. Yeah. Um, NPC summon locations, a little bit tougher in Scholar, I think. Yeah, they're much more hard to find. Uh, they're not, like, in front of the boss anymore. Yeah, Lucatio has one that's, like, 
like really, really out of the way in the gutter, I think it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, she also has one hidden under a random box in uh, the No Man's Wharf. I don't know why she's hiding. Yeah. I, but uh, the, the thing with that is, like, you're not really ever supposed to break boxes in Dark Souls. I mean, you can. There's no penalty for it, but... Mm-hmm. There's also very rarely any reason to. So usually at that point you're conditioned to not waste your time. So yeah. that's another one that's really easy to overlook. Mm-hmm. But um, the changes like uh, to uh, Dragon Shrine, I think wherever the area with the Dragon's area. Yeah, um, that was, I think, my favorite change to uh, from mm-hmm. original Scholar. Where the, the Dragon Knights wouldn't attack you; they would just like stand on the staircase and like watch you as you walked up. Yeah, um, it was it was really cool because they would. Uh, the Dragon Knights, the, this area was like kind of difficult because these Dragon Knights were like really hard to fight. Uh, so in Scholar, uh, instead they made the Dragon Knights like way tougher, uh, but pretty much they just like, you go up to them and they stand in a circle and they send like one champion out uh, and you have to fight this champion. Uh, and if you leave the circle, uh, then they'll see that you have no honor and they'll all attack you. Yeah. Um, and this is never, this is never stated mm-hmm. uh, by any of them. Like. There's, you know, like, there's no, like, a big, you know, tutorial pop-up that says, like, leave the area and you'll be attacked. Yeah, there's there's no spoken dialogue, there's no text or anything, it all just happens. Yeah, uh, like, you just, you know, they all just stand around you, and one comes out and attacks you, and the rest are all non-hostile, and you kill it, and the other one's just like, okay, and then they turn around and, you know, like, don't bother you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was, um, I think it was a really interesting way uh, to add a lot of uh, flavor to that area, mm-hmm. um, make it much more yeah. interesting. Because it was—it's a cool area that just like not a whole lot happens in. Yeah. I mean, you get the cinematic bridge, which is eh, whatever. It's cool. <laughs> uh, nothing happens. Um, I think if you stay on the bridge, like a dragon just knocks you off. Yeah. But I've—I've I've never done that because it just takes so long. That I was like, just walk. I, I did it once, uh, and it looks pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, if you—if you just walk across, it'll never happen. Yeah. Um. And, I mean, you get, like, the zip lines, and, like, there are some giant dragons that are, like, have way less health than they really should. Yeah, there's a bunch of goofy zip lines uh, between all these giant dragon nests. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, is there anything else to talk about with Dark Souls 2, other than maybe comparing it to 3? Because I do um, want to talk about how 3 kind of abandoned a lot of the, like, ingenuity that 2 had. Because uh, we also didn't bring up that 2 was made by kind of the B team of From Software. Because it, yeah. it was being developed... Alongside Dark Souls One, not not exactly at the same time, but it started development before one release. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. it was being it was also being developed alongside Bloodborne. Yeah. And as it, it was two and Bloodborne that were made by the same team, right? Um, Bloodborne's the A team, I think. Okay. And like Dark Souls Two, like the joke is. Um, like thanks B team every time mm-hmm. every time something bad happens in Dark Souls two yeah which is it's interesting a lot of a lot of the fan reaction to two is negative yeah I think it's positive now um, yeah uh, the critical reception to Dark Souls two was very positive mm-hmm. it was it was a lot of the like you know the really really like intensely into Dark Souls one fans didn't care for it as much mm-hmm. which you know I've Resident Evil's had that problem Zelda's had that problem yeah that's just how it goes yeah um, I've always preferred to. Uh, I, I admit that one's better, for, like thematically and its story and characters and stuff. But two, I just power stancing is really cool. Power stancing is very cool. Plays better. I never die to geometry that doesn't make sense. I never, I never just slip through the floor. Mm-hmm. Well, one's one's janky, but I, I think I'll always prefer it because of the reasons you were mentioning. No, not uh, falling through floors. <laughs> falling through floors. And- but the, the reasons why you were saying, you know, like the thematically, um, yeah, like story and characters and. Um, mm-hmm. All that. I mean, they're they're both masterpieces. I just don't think two gets enough credit because I think I think two is a natural evolution of the gameplay that one invented. Yeah. Um, I just don't think its world structure is as good. And no. I don't think it's anywhere near as good. Um, actually, talking about that a little bit, um, I think adding warping from the very beginning in Dark Souls two was a mistake. I do too because the areas you go into, like backtracking from them, is not that difficult. It wouldn't have been that hard to just like make a tunnel that leads back to the hub or something. Yeah. Because um, that's another thing people complain about is that it's disconnected. Whereas Dark Souls One, like you would open a door and it would be an elevator that leads back to the hub, yeah. which just is not present ever in two. Because like I mean, in Dark Souls One, they uh, Super Bunny Hub actually has a. I'm pretty sure it's Super Bunny Hub has like a yeah. really good video talking about. Um, how it's uh, Dark vertical. Souls design. Yeah, Dark Souls 1's vertical design. And um, 
how since there wasn't warping at the beginning of the game, uh, they were pretty much required to build the world so that you could always get back to wherever you wanted pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of why the world design sort of falls apart in the uh, later parts of the game is because you then have warping. So like yeah. they don't need to work as hard about um, making this world this like very deeply connected place. Um, in Dark Souls One, space feels sort of abstracted, but there is like a a real physical area connecting all of these different places you're going to. Uh, whereas Dark Souls yeah. Two sort of embraces the opposite of that. Yeah, because there's abstraction, and then there's like floating lava castle is somehow above like sky view Earth and Peak. Yeah, um, like like so you're. You're in this like windmill, like kind of castle situation, and mm -hmm. you get to the top, and you can see the horizon, you can see the sky the entire time you're there, and then you ride an elevator, and now you're in a castle that's on a pool of lava that was never visible before. Yeah, it's like the um, the transition from uh, Majula, which is the hub area, uh, to Heights Tower Flame. Uh, where you travel through these like underground sewers, sort of makes sense as far as like an abstraction of space. Uh, whereas like when you when you go th when you go through those tunnels, you end up in Heights Tower Flame, and if you look around behind you, um, Jula is like much further off in the distance than uh, how far you actually travel. Um, and like that makes sense, you know, it's uh, sort of building on those themes that Dark Souls One kind of couldn't do, mm -hmm. uh, of like trying to like really like you traveled a short distance physically, but like. Uh, in the world, you traveled a really like far distance, mm -hmm. um, which is a cool idea, but it doesn't really matter because none of the other areas take advantage of that. I don't really think. Yeah, um, from No Man's Wharf, you don't really because because you warp the Lost Steel both ways you get to it. Yeah, because you take the ship from No Man's Wharf or you ride a bird from ride a bird. <laughs> yeah, uh, but either way, you functionally warp to it, so you don't even get to see off in the distance like. From the ship, you don't get to see the pier of No Man's Wharf. And from No Man's Wharf, you don't see the Lost Bastille. Mm. Well, in, um... You can see uh, the Lost Bastille from the, uh... The bird warp, which is... <laughs> you curl up like an egg in a giant bird's nest, and the bird just, like, lifts you off and takes you to this place. Which is... <laughs> which happened in one. Yeah, it, happens, it happened in one. Uh, so, I, yeah, I guess it's a theme... <laughs> being lifted by a giant bird by pretending to be an egg. Which <laughs> is, I think, great. Yeah. I like that post that's like, hey, it's your Uber driver, I'm here, and it's just a picture of the bird from Dark Souls. Nice. But, um... Yeah, like, there's there's none of that other, um... None of that sense of, like, that any of these places really matter or that they're connected in any meaningful way in Dark Souls 2. Um... I, I think the most disappointing is... It, not like as far as like space goes, but as far as like being an important area, uh, the Shrine of Winter, mm -hmm. which is your um, your big goal at the very beginning of the game, is to get to the Shrine of Winter and get past it. Um, but you only have to go to the Shrine of Winter because there's like a tiny, tiny tree in the way of the regular path that you would there, walk past. Th there's like an archway that's broken and fallen down, and like you can just hop over it. Yeah, like <laughs> very very easily. Uh, like so it's, instead, it's, it's not like you know in. In Zelda, it's like, oh, it's a, it's a high wall. You could probably, you know, like, get a step stool. It's like, no, it's probably, like, two feet high. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can basically see it. It's, you, like, two feet high. Your character could, like, just lift their leg a little higher than normal and, and get over it. Mm -hmm. But instead, you have to go on this big, long quest just to open a door and go around. And you even come out the other side, and you can see the landscape beyond that. Like, you literally just walk a circle around it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, the Shrine of Winter doesn't matter. Why, why is the Shrine of Winter even... Like, in-game, why was it built? Because... Did, did they assume that archway was going to fall eventually and nobody would bother to climb over it? Like, because um, one, of, one of the uh, things that Dark Souls 2 did, interestingly, was um, all of these challenges were uh, not just set up to make sure that there was, like, one powerful enough to assume the throne, uh, but to make sure that, uh, like, the antagonist of Dark Souls 2 uh, could not do this. Mm -hmm. um, which, to, like... She could very easily climb over two feet of rubble. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the antagonist of Dark Souls 2 being the queen, uh, who is in the castle past the two feet of rubble. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so who, obviously very easily did so. Yeah, and also fights you in the throne room that you're supposed to be keeping her away from. Yeah. Like, because cause you get in, and the throne watcher and the throne defender fight you, and then immediately after you fight the queen, Nishandra, she could have just walked up to it while you were doing that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean the because um, because you opened it and those two people were already in it. The idea is that she can't get into the throne at one uh, because she can't manipulate souls like undead can. Mm-hmm. Um, so she wanted you so to can't... open the way and then kill you to get in. Yeah, but like like. There's two steps of uh, getting into the throne of one, one of which is getting these golems to like lay down to form steps, mm-hmm. which is like a, a like a 15 foot gap, like you can yeah. get like a really big ladder or something. Yeah. Uh, and the second step is opening a door, <laughs> um, which you can. It's a door. <laughs> yeah, it's not a magic door. You you just can't open it. Well, because yeah. you have to get the king's ring, don't you? Yes, it, it's magically sealed. Um, but like I. I just, I assume she could probably find some way to get through that. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no implication because like the you open the door and then you also see like the the rocks on either side of it that's holding it up. Yeah, but like she could just knock those down. <laughs> she she's an all powerful like undead wizard. Yes. <laughs> and I I know we're like nitpicking a little bit, but like in game there's, I mean people destroy structures like the, there's an entire scene where you fight the giant lord where like they're blowing up the ballistas and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So like. There's not an in lore reason why she can't just bust that piece of the castle down. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, like, she could just, like, lay a ladder down. And also, uh, I take a bigger issue with the fact that since you fight her in the throne room, she's she's in there, and her objective is to kill you. But if she kills you... She can't open the door. She can't open it. You just come back and eventually kill her. Like, she can't possibly win. And yeah. so, so her, her goal, like, her plot was thwarted from the very beginning, because... Killing you doesn't stop you from coming back, and it also doesn't open the pathway, so killing you indefinitely isn't going to work. Like, Vendor didn't really even have to do anything. She was just too dumb to succeed from the <laughs> very beginning. He, he just had to put steps in, and, like, <laughs> automatically he won. <laughs> yeah, like, that's, that's what sucks. I, I hate Nishandra as a villain, because they're just there isn't a universe where she can succeed. Which yeah. is why Gwyn from Dark Souls 1 is a more interesting boss, because he doesn't have a goal. His goal is be a zombie and yeah. hit, hit people who walk in his door with a sword. Like, he sort of wants to be defeated by you, which is why he stays there and doesn't, you know, like, do the thing where he accomplishes his dark evil goal. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, his, his goal isn't to have gotten anywhere. His, he, he's, he's too far gone because he's hollowed. He, yeah. The, the concept of a goal doesn't exist because he doesn't have a brain anymore he's a zombie. But he's a zombie with a flaming sword, and he's going to use it because he thinks it's cool, because it's the only thought he has left. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I do think Dark Souls 2's story is weak, which is really unfortunate because 1's was so strong. Mm-hmm. Um, I overlooked that for the gameplay, which I think is the best in the series, except for Bloodborne, if that counts. Yeah. Because uh, I think Bloodborne is the best Dark Souls game, but... <laughs> Soulsborne. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to briefly talk about, like, what how how threes how how three used two, um, which was it didn't. Yeah. Because um, three was also being developed at the same time as two, I believe. Mm. Um, and three is a more direct sequel to one. Like you return to Anor Londo, and like when you fight, uh, crap, what's his name? Aldrich. Yeah, Aldrich. He has Gwendolyn. Like he's actively eating Gwendolyn, and you can see like Gwendolyn's on top of his sludgy head. Mm. <clears throat> um. Yorshka is presumed to be like a descendant of Priscilla or something like that. The same the same like creature that. as Priscilla. Yeah. Um, you go to an area similar to um, Ariana. It's called Ariandel in the DLC. And they actually... Um, it'll probably be revealed by the time we actually post this video, but just a few days ago, they some somebody found the name of the new DLC. It's oh, called really? the City of the Dead. So it's probably going to be uh, New Londo. Okay, that'll be... Really cool, actually. Yeah. I love that. Which is... Are they going to talk about the angels in about 3? Because, you know, that's a really gaping thing they didn't talk about. I yeah. hope I hope that's what this is for. Because mm-hmm. uh, Ariandel was, a, like, a stealth DLC about the, the sisters. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hope this is stealthily about the, the angels. Because mm-hmm. angels are presumably villains in 3. Um, you only ever fight them... Like, you don't meet an angel and they help you or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, hopefully it covers Londor, too, which I'm assuming is just going to be new Londo. Well, the the Londor DLC was presumably Ariandel. It's when you... That's, oh, that's okay. where you interact with the characters who yeah, are from yeah, Londor. Yeah. But yeah, like, new Londo probably is Londor, so yeah. it'll probably also be about them. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. That's, that's, that's the thing with Dark Souls 1 is, like, they did a very good job of covering 
basically every plot detail that was like outstanding and interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> and even more, like Manus isn't really hinted at at all in the base game. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, he, but he's really central to the whole series. Mm. But yeah, I don't know. When when you create a masterpiece like Dark Souls One, like succeeding that is very difficult. Yeah, I mean Dark Souls Two and Three. Um, despite my complaints about them when they came out, are both very good games. Yeah, like, my complaints about Dark Souls 3 is that it's not a perfect game. Yeah. Because Dark Souls 1 was pretty close to it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think that's about it for our Dark Souls 2 episode, unless we have any closing thoughts. Uh, Reba, do you want to say anything? Um, I have played exactly 10 minutes of Dark Souls 2. That's <laughs> it. And I looked it up, and it was actually Dark Souls 2, and not oh, Dark okay. Souls 3. Um, because I watched the opening cutscene while uh, you guys were just chatting. Um, <laughs> this is like the twelfth discussion we've had about the exact same topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, this this actually uh, in Respawn Lounge War. This is the, the conversation we were having. We were playing Dark Souls too when we came up with Respawn Lounge. Yeah. Yeah, because we were on Discord with Anna and she gave us the idea because we were just talking about this exact subject. So this should be mm -hmm. our anniversary episode. We'll upload this in a few years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, the only thing that I have to say is, like, I think something that I said uh, when we talked about Dark Souls 1 and that I don't play difficult games because I don't like them. Um, and what I've played of Dark Souls isn't, like, too terrible. I just, like, that's my uh, unpopular opinion and it, everybody always gets mad at me whenever I say that, like, I just don't think that hard games, I, I don't like them. But <laughs> uh, I, I'm just a really big proponent of like accessibility in games. So for me, there's no reason for a game to be super difficult because I'm sure that I could enjoy Dark Souls at some point. And there is ways to go about like creating a, your own difficulty curve in the game. Like if you pick mm. certain classes, it's going to be easier than others, you know. But it's it's just I don't know. That's that's like my my take on it and why I haven't played a ton of it. And also, I like just I don't have anything that can run it. I played ten minutes on Dan's computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's yeah. I mean, that's that's really all I have to say. Like, typically ever about most difficult games is that I think they're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as somebody who has like. I've, I've been playing games my whole life, and I know that I'm bad at games uh, because I just have a lot of problems with hand-eye coordination, and I have hand tremors and you know other things that make it difficult for me to play games. And when a game is very, you know, like Dark Souls, is very much uh, like based on you know having split-second reactions and that sort of stuff, it can be really, really difficult for me to like see the point of playing a game that's super hard it, mm -hmm. when I. I can't play it. But that, that's something that is very notably uh, From's goal, is kind of reviving that really niche, like, difficult game. Yeah. Because a lot of people say, like, games are too easy now, games hold your hand, uh, press F to pay respects or whatever. Like, uh. obviously all of that's hyperbole, but there weren't a whole lot of, like, Zelda 1, you know, don't tell you anything, just throw you into a world. Like, those games kind of ceased to be for a while. Yeah. And... I respect Dark Souls for kind of, like, reinventing that and bringing that back into the world. I don't think you're less of a gamer if you don't play it or don't like it or whatever. No, I mean, that's fine. But it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a genre that I'm happy is making a return. Yeah. For me, I'm, I'm fine with games don't tell you anything, and that's part of the, like, experience is figuring out, you know, what the hell's going on. Because that's very much, too, you know, even how eco is or whatever, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, an easy game, quote-unquote, in, in the sense that... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a very difficult game. It's also not a very fun game. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't tell you, this is the button you use to, to hit things, or mm -hmm. this is the button you use. Like, it's, it just throws you in, and you just kind of have to figure out what's going on by yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but the difference is Dark Souls has uh, things to do. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. has things to do, but also... I'm not very scorned by ego at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but also that there's no way for me to, you know, like adjust the difficulty of like mm. the attacks because that is a really big problem for me is that um you know like i can't even play most rhythm games because i have just like such a lag in like i uh i've played music for years so i have a really good sense of like 
beat and rhythm and everything, but I can't play rhythm games because I have just, like, a mental lag between, like, feeling the rhythm and then hitting the button. Um, So games can be really hard for me, which is aggravating because, like, I do want to play Dark Souls and experience that, but the only way for me to do it is, like, you know... Is, didn't Pip's dad, like, took him for, uh, like, two years to finish the game or whatever? Pip, Pip's dad played Dark Souls? Maybe not Pip's dad. It was uh, somebody's dad. I know, um, his, I know his mom played Melee. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was somebody who I was talking to. Um, their... I don't think it was any of our... I know Jake's dad plays Mega Man. Yeah, he loves Mega Man. That's, that's the only dad I know that plays video games. Um, but it was it was someone's parent had beaten Dark Souls uh, by just taking forever and leveling up and just oh, like... yeah, because it is an RPG. Like, you can yeah. just, like, win by having bigger numbers. Yeah, yeah you, which... You can grind your way through. Is not... It's not intended, true but it's... to the experience, which makes it frustrating. Yeah. Well, I mean... I don't know. I mean, it's, it it's is just much of, an option. It is sort of true to the experience. Like, um... Because Dark Souls 1 is supposed to be about struggling to get through like that's part of the theme is that um like you're is the is like the frustration of like is my goal really worth it should i just give up um, yeah like, like the, how do i become better how do i become stronger because because the assumption is that all the hollows you mean the game are other players who quit yeah um every every character who dies in dark souls and becomes hollow is somebody who gave up uh and like let let go of their goals and like which uh, means i killed you <laughs> and, and abandon what they were trying to do, uh, which I think thematically, like they do really well. Like, um, mm-hmm. well, you, especially you, you with, leveling, like, is in world explained. Like, yeah, it's you taking the fragments of the dark soul and like getting closer and closer to fully realizing a lord soul. Mm-hmm. So that's that's why you get like superhuman strength. Yeah. So so even like grinding for levels has like an in game explanation because it's just like it's you, like, sort of just like brutally making your way through this world mm-hmm. which I, I think is I think is very cool I, I think yeah, it's like you, really you run your head into a brick wall infinite times and it eventually crumbles yeah your head just keeps coming back together your, as long your as head you, keeps coming back and the wall doesn't as long as you don't give up your head keeps coming back <laughs> alright uh, anything else about Dark Souls 2 it's my favorite that isn't Bloodborne uh, I think Dark Souls 2 is fantastic and that's that's pretty much all I gotta say about it Okay, great. So, uh... We were, any, any fun thoughts? Um... I named my character Mingus. <laughs> that's... <laughs> Solid. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what, also... What was, what was my first character? I don't remember. I don't remember his name. I don't it was like know. Rockefeller or something. Casey makes yeah, pretty boys. And I, I, I made beautiful men. I go the monster factory Good. route. <laughs> well, Don, Don made Blue Beetle and Bloodborne. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, he's horrifying. <laughs> anyway... Um, we're recording on order now, so I don't know what next next week's episode is going to be. So it'll it'll be here when it gets here. It will be, and you'll you're going to find out. <laughs> yep, you'll know before I do. <laughs> I already made that joke. All right, anyway. Yeah. Turn, turn it off, man. <laughs> oh, uh, I think we should also give you know a shout out to to Parker for making the music. Um, yeah, thank you, Parker. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. It's lit. Yeah, uh, we did bring it up in the in the first episode, but again, check him out on SoundCloud. Check him out on his Twitter, uh, both of which are under uh, Atrium A T R I U M oh. underscore underscore. I'll link those in the YouTube chat or the YouTube description again. Yeah, awesome. yeah, should be really easy to find. Okay, I think we're done then. All right, have Thanks a good week, everybody.